Are you ready? Yes? yes? All right, let's get into the Word. Let's have a word of prayer and let's begin. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the privilege to once again come back to study your Word. And we thank you, dear God, for the blessings that you have given to us through your Spirit to help us understand Bible prophecy, to understand where we are in time, that we may know exactly what to do. And I ask that you will give us that wisdom now as we go forward in faith to study your words. May we be edified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last night, we were entertaining the question, have our minds been diverted? And the reason we ask is because we know that there are several things that are taking place in our world right now. But the problem is we don't necessarily know how to put it all together, that we can really understand what's going on right now, what's everything leading up to. We see lots of events, we see lots of things that are happening in our world, but we don't necessarily understand where is it all leading up to. Right now, one of the things that has taken our world by storm, and I mean, this has been a special form of agitation, and I found in my research that you're even dealing with this question here in the Philippines. And it's the issue of the moral decline that is taking place in our communities. Now, what I want us to do is I want us to begin to look at the Bible. Let's look at Luke, the 17th chapter. Let's notice some things the Bible says. Luke, the 17th chapter. And we're going to pick up right where we left off, understanding, have our minds been diverted? And I believe the answer is yes. To a very large degree, our minds have been diverted. Today, many people are scoffers. They don't believe anymore. There are even Seventh-day Adventists that don't believe. There are many Seventh-day Adventists that don't understand what, what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. They don't understand why we are Seventh-day Adventists. We, many people think that we're just another insignificant denomination to tell everybody a bunch of things that people already know. If you think the only reason why Seventh-day Adventists exist is to tell people about the Sabbath, I'm going to let you know right now. God doesn't need us. There's Seventh-day Baptists. There's Seventh-day Pentecostals. There's the Seventh-day Church of God. There are many Sabbath-keeping organizations that exist today, but none of them can finish the work. None of them. It's going to take more than just simply knowing which day of the week is the Sabbath to finish this work. There's a great experience that God wants to bring us into, which includes the Sabbath, and therefore we are to bring the whole picture together but you're going to see that the Bible shows us that there was a prophetic harbinger on the moral decline, and it's spelled out in Luke, the 17th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 28 and 29, and if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Luke 27, 28, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. <clears throat> but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. The Bible makes it clear that we are to understand that when the climate of our world reaches the same climate as it was in the days of Lot, that was to be received as a sign that the coming of Christ was near. Now, I want you to couple that with 2 Peter 2. Let's look at what the Bible says in 2 Peter, the second chapter. 2 Peter, and now we're going to look at chapter 2. And let's see what the Bible says as we consider uh, verses 6 and 7 of 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. When you get there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. Now the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them and overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. In the days of Lot, there were definitely wicked people doing wicked things. But in the days of Lot, there was also righteous people that, that their righteous souls were being vexed by the wicked things that they were beholding on a regular basis. Now, we certainly, if we are going to see that as it was in the days of Lot, 
so it is in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, then obviously we should be on the side of those who references Lot's character, wherein his righteous soul was vexed by the wicked things that he saw, the unlawful deeds. Now, what were some of these unlawful deeds? Go to the book of Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. What were some of these unlawful deeds that were taking place? Go, notice what the Bible says in Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 49. Ezekiel 16, and we're going to look at verse 49. Now, the Bible helps us see some of the things that was taking place in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, in the days of Lot. And I want you to see what the Bible says. And there were two things we're going to look at, verses 49 and verse 50 in Ezekiel, the 16th chapter. If you're there, please say amen. amen. Now, notice, the Bible says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Verse 50, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away as I saw good. God made it clear that there were several things that was being done in Sodom that made it such a wicked city that God saw it fit to destroy them. One of the things we see is pride. So we should make sure pride is not in our lives. We should not be a proud people. We should be a humble people. We also see fullness of bread. Another way of saying fullness of bread is gluttony. That's why when people say that our eating and our drinking habits don't affect our salvation, I correct them on this very point. The Bible shows that eating and drinking habits can affect your salvation. If you don't believe me, just look carefully at the verse. The iniquity, anything that the Bible calls iniquity can separate you from God. It can affect your salvation. And the Bible says that an act of iniquity is fullness of bread. Another way of saying fullness of bread is gluttony. Another way of saying gluttony is overeating. In the eyes of God, overeating is a sin. God does not want us to overeat because he knows what it does to our minds. When you eat too much food, it causes dopamine disorders, and when you suffer with dopamine disorders, you cannot function, you cannot think properly, you cannot solve problems, you cannot pay attention. These are all the things that happens when an individual suffers from dopamine disorders. And that comes, one of the ways that it can come is by overeating. So that's the reason why God hates gluttony so much. That's, I, I challenge any of you, study gluttony throughout the Bible. Study the term fullness of bread. You will see that God does not want us to eat until we're full. He wants us to eat until we're satisfied. When you eat until you're full, it's going to tax the system and it's going to put the mind in a condition where you're not going to be able to focus properly. So fullness of bread is also on the list. But then, in addition to that, what else was on the list? It said pride, fullness of bed, bread, abundance of idleness. Idleness is the devil's workshop. When individuals are just idle and they just have nothing to do and they just sit around, these are some of the greatest ways that people fall into some of the most base sins. This is how men can end up and women can end up on the internet going to pornographic websites and all these things. When you just have nothing to do, after a while, you're going to find the nearest thing to do that pleases you naturally. And many a times, we will find ourselves going in the path of destruction, idleness, abundance of idleness. All these were things that were taking place. But in verse 50... Notice what the Bible says next. It says, and they were haughty and committed what? Abominations. Now, there are several things that the Bible calls abomination, but perhaps one of the greatest abominations, one of the greatest abominations that took place in Sodom is found right here in Leviticus, the 19th chapter. Let's go there very quickly. Let me see if I can find it. I may or may not have success. I don't know. But let's see if we can find it. Leviticus, uh, the 19th chapter. And let's see if we find it here. Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. Bear with me. I know it's in Leviticus. I thought it was 19. Let's see if I could find it in a different place. 
All right. Because I cannot find the reference in the Old Testament, I'll give you the reference in the New Testament. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look specifically at verse 27. Ah, okay. I found both. Let's do Romans 1 and verse 27, and then we'll go back to Leviticus. I found it. All right. Romans 1 and verse 27. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans 1 and verse 27, and likewise also, these are several things that were happening as a result of people turning away from God. It says in verse 27, and likewise also, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. The Bible actually condemns the idea of men being with men as a man was to be with a woman. This is dealing with the great t subject or issue of homosexuality. Now, go back to Leviticus, but what we're doing now is we're going to look at Leviticus 18 and verse 22. Because remember, one of the things that they were committing in Sodom and Gomorrah is they were committing abomination. Now, here it is in Romans 1, 27. We certainly see the reference to homosexuality as something God does not approve. But now look at Leviticus 18 and verse 22. This is more clear. The Bible says in Leviticus 18 and verse 22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So therefore, God was making it clear. Man was not to lie with mankind as he would with womankind. Because if he did that, the Bible says that that was an abomination. So when we look at Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible makes it clear that it wasn't just pride. It wasn't just fullness of bread. It was not just abundance of idleness. It was not just that they were not feeding and taking care of the needs of the poor, but they were also practicing abominations. And one of the key abominations that was in Sodom and Gomorrah was that they were men lying with men as a man would lie with a woman. This the Bible calls an abomination. You remember in Sodom and Gomorrah when the two angels who were male figures, when they were seen, the men knocked on, Adam, on, on Lot's door and they said, give us those men that we may lie with them. They wanted to commit the abominable act of homosexual intercourse one with another. This in the Bible is referred to as a sin. This is an abomination. This is what was taking place. Now, God says when we see the things that were taking place in the days of Lot, we should understand that it's a sign. Now, in the days of Lot, it was popular to be homosexual. It was unpopular to not be homosexual. It was popular to be homosexual. It was unpopular not to be homosexual. Now, we are living in a community today and in a world today, when you look at the vast scope of what's happening in our world, there was a time that to be homosexual was something someone would do in the closet. It was something that someone would basically live behind closed doors and nobody would know. But today, there is a boldness of homosexuality to the point that now there are famous actors and actresses, famous celebrities and sports figures, and the list goes on. Even people in government, even the very president of the United States has stamped his approval and, and endorsement personally on not just simply homosexual lifestyle, but even homosexual marriage. This has become an issue even in the Philippines. Right now, it is being raised up on a regular basis should the Philippines follow suit with everybody else that they should go ahead and approve of homosexual marriage, gay marriage. This is being agitated right now in the Philippines. So therefore, this thing is affecting us worldwide. Now, here's the trap. Many people today are just simply looking at the issue of 
homosexuality or gay marriage, and they're just looking at it on the surface saying, oh, this is another form of lifestyle that's wrong, that people are trying to pursue and get all their equal rights. But brothers and sisters, to the Seventh-day Adventists, it should be a lot deeper than that. I want you to think about this. When God established marriage, it was supposed to be between a man and a woman, husband and wife. But now all of a sudden, instead of it being man with woman, now it's man with man. Walking down the aisle together in holy matrimony, an absolute perversion of what God has said. And I'm going to let you know this, the homosexual community is very interesting to me. And I wish that I could address them. And the reason why is because I would let those in the gay community understand this. There was a time that when it was not popular to be homosexual, people would hide behind the closet and they would dare not make it known because they would suffer ridicule. Now, when that time existed, homosexuals, they hated it when people would stand up against homosexuality and all these other things, and they would use governmental powers to try to persecute and oppress the homosexual lifestyle, and the list goes on. Well, today the tide has turned. Now it is popular to be gay. It has never been more popular. It has never been more acceptable to be homosexual. And as a result of this, it is becoming more unpopular to be heterosexual. It is becoming more unpopular to say that man belongs with woman and woman with man. Now watch this. What's interesting is now today, whenever somebody in politics, whenever somebody in business states their Christian belief and says, we, according to the Bible, believe that when a man lies with a woman, um, a man lies with a man as with a woman, that that's an abomination now the gay community is now wanting to oppress the heterosexuals. Now they're going around telling everybody, you should fire them. You should get them off of your job. There was a man who was working for one of the major sports networks, I believe it was ESPN, and all he did was he stated that he believed that the homosexual lifestyle is wrong and is a sin according to the Bible. The gay community got so mad that they wrote letters to ESPN and said, you should fire him. You should get rid of him. You should punish him. We're going to government. And it's interesting, now that homosexuality is popular, they're doing the very thing that they did not want to be done to them when homosexuality was unpopular. Now they're becoming a persecuting power to people who hold the belief that say this lifestyle is an abomination. And therefore we have this agitation going on, but it gets deeper than that. You see, when you look at President Barack Obama, with all due respect, in October 2004, here's what he stated before he was president. What I believe is that marriage is between a man and a woman. What I believe in my faith is that a man and a woman, when they get married, are performing something before God. And it's not simply the two persons who are meeting. Then he was the U.S. Senate candidate, Obama, Barack Obama. So when he was just simply a U.S. candidate, he made it very clear that he believed that homosexual lifestyle is wrong. He believed that marriage was something that was to be between a man and a woman, and he based his belief on his faith in God. Do you see that? That's his own words. Now here's where it gets interesting. He's now president. And not only is he president, but when President Barack Obama, when he made a decision to go ahead and strive for re-election, it was interesting that now when he was striving for re-election, and of course, you know, he had to win the votes. What was the great topic going on in 2012 when all the votes had to go through? It was gay marriage. So it's interesting. In 2004, he says, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. What I believe in my faith is that a man and a woman, when they get married, are performing something before God. So notice that God is his foundation. His faith is his foundation. And I would dare to say the scriptures were his foundation. Now, he's now striving for president. This is May 9th, 2012. Notice the change. All of a sudden, it says, President Barack Obama on Wednesday announced his support for gay marriage. Oh, that's very interesting. In 2004, he was against it. Now, all of a sudden, he's for it. Now, I want you to notice what he says here. This is very interesting. 
This is what President Barack Obama said, May 9th, 2012. I have to tell you that over the course of several years, as I have talked to friends and family and neighbors, when I think about members of my own staff who are in incredibly committed monogamous relationships, same-sex relationships, who are raising kids together, when I think about those soldiers or airmen or marines or sailors who are out there fighting on behalf on, on my behalf and yet feel constrained even now that don't ask, don't tell is gone because they are not able to commit themselves in a marriage at a certain point, I've just concluded that for me personally, it is important for me to go ahead and affirm that I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Now, that's his own words. Now, brothers and sisters, I try to respect our leaders as much as possible. My wife will tell you that night after night and day after day, when we pray, we pray for the leadership of our church. We pray for the leadership of our country. We are told in the book, Great Controversy, that there will be many in leadership in government who are going to hear the third angel's message and are going to respond to God and surrender their hearts to Jesus Christ. We should be praying for our leaders. So I pray for President Obama all the time. Now, here's the thing. On this one, we have to call it on the carpet. That is being two-faced. One minute, he made it clear. Based on my faith, based on God's word and God's position, I cannot endorse gay marriage. Now, he moves from faith. I want you to pay attention to what he said. It was not because of what he reread in the Bible. It was not because he prayed and communed with God. What was the reason he changed his position? He changed his position because he talked to friends and family and neighbors. And as he talked to his friends, as he talked to his family, as he talked to his neighbors, and as he considered what the people are doing on behalf of the United States of America, and the list goes on, that's what made him change his mind. Now, brothers and sisters, you need to understand the prophetic implications of that because I'm about to show you after President Barack Obama did it all of a sudden Hillary Clinton how many of you know who Hillary Clinton is you know who Hillary Clinton is all right now all of a sudden MSN March 18th 2013 this year Hillary Clinton now comes on the scene and she says I support marriage for lesbian and gay couples Clinton says in the video I support it personally and as a matter of policy and law, embedded in a broader effort to advance equality and opportunity for the LGBT Americans and for all Americans. So it was interesting. Now, all of a sudden, Hillary Clinton's coming on the bandwagon. And I was wondering, why is Hillary Clinton making this public declaration that she, too, supports gay marriage? But then all of a sudden, I said, oh, this is why. Look at what it says next. She continues, like so many others, my views have been shaped over time by people I have known and loved, by my experience representing our nation on the world stage, my devotion to law and human rights, and the guiding principles of my faith. So she's trying to not only include friends and family and all these other influences, but she's also saying that it was the guiding principles of her faith. Now, brothers and sisters, Hillary Clinton is a Methodist. I challenge you, read any Methodist article, you will find Methodists do not support homosexual lifestyle. So I don't know what she means when she says the guiding principles of her faith because her faith condemns homosexual marriage and homosexual lifestyle. So I don't know what she means by that, but I did think that this was interesting. These are her first comments backing gay marriage since leaving the State Department, and they could potentially hint at her 2016 ambitions. It says, after President Obama, Vice President Biden, and other Democrats have endorsed gay marriage, it's likely that the future Democratic nominee in 2016 and beyond will have to back it as well. In other words, they're saying maybe Hillary Clinton is setting the stage for when 2016 comes and it'll be time to vote for the new president that she wants to set the stage now to say, hey guys, I support you too. Now, the reason why this gets very, very significant is because we have been told through the prophetic eye that God said something. Notice what God said. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators 
in order to what? Secure public favor. What did Jesus tell us was going to happen? In order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has caused so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice what's being said here. We are being told prophetically that political corruption is destroying love of justice in even free America and that the rulers and legislators will yield to secure public favor to the popular demand. Is it a popular demand for gay marriage? So it was no wonder that in 2004, Barack Obama says, according to my faith, I believe man with woman. But when it came time for re-election, he says, hey, you know what? I've had a revelation. And now he says that I believe gay marriage is all right. And lo and behold, he won. Now this gets interesting because we're told that to secure public favor, they will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Now, this gets very interesting. In other words, is there a connection between gay marriage, the gay marriage issue, and the Sunday law issue? Is there a connection? See, it's not just simply, you got to understand, brothers and sisters, you got to see things prophetically. It is not just simply that the homosexual community is promoting homosexuality but they're promoting gay what? Marriage. Now, wait a minute. When was marriage created? Was marriage created before sin or after sin? It was before sin. So in other words, is marriage a holy institution? Yes, it is. Now, was there any other institution that existed before sin like marriage? It was the Sabbath. So notice that before sin, there were two holy institutions. The two holy institutions was marriage and the Sabbath. Right now in America, legally from a governmental standpoint, they are addressing the subject of gay marriage. So the marriage institution is currently under attack. Are you following so far? Now, the reason why this gets interesting is because did you know something about marriage and the Sabbath? How many of you have ever heard of something called co-joined twins? You ever heard of co-joined twins? You ever see those twins where sometimes they're born and their heads are attached together? They're called co-joined twins. Now watch this. Did you know that when one twin is affected, it actually hurts the other twin? Did you know that? Here's why I, I bring this point up to you. You see, we are to understand when the Pharisees afterward questioned him concerning the lawfulness of divorce, Jesus pointed his hearers back to the marriage institution as ordained at creation. Because of the hardness of your hearts, he said, Moses suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He referred them to the blessed days of Eden when God pronounced all things very good. Then marriage and the Sabbath had their origin. Twin institutions for the glory of God in the benefit of humanity. So inspiration refers to marriage and the Sabbath as what? Twin institutions. Now, it's one thing to have twins. It's another thing to be co-joined twins. I have twins in my family. My brother, Michael, and my sister, Michelle, were twins. They're fraternal twins. And you may have twins in your family, but co-joined twins, we know that they are indissolubly linked together. Is that right? Now, marriage and the Sabbath are not just simply twin institutions. They are indissolubly linked together like co-joined twins. And remember, when co-joined twins, when one twin suffers, the other one what? Suffers as well. Now, watch this. 
When you look at this quote here, it says, The Sabbath and the family were alike instituted in Eden, and in God's purpose, they are indissolubly linked together. So marriage and the Sabbath are not just simply twins. They are like co-joined twins. They are indissolubly linked together. So when you attack one institution, it is a precursor that the other institution is soon to be attacked as well. That's what God wants you to see with the prophetic eye. This issue of gay marriage, to some people, is just an issue. To others, it's prophecy. They are going to government on the institution of marriage, and brothers and sisters, it only will be a matter of time before individuals are going to go to government for the institution of a Sunday law. And when we see leadership saying we will yield to the public favor so that we can win their demands, win their votes, and we will yield to their popular demands and even surrender their religious rights, when we see that taking place in the world of politics on the point of gay marriage, you don't think that they'll do the same thing when the issues of the false Sabbath begin to rise? This is what God wanted us to see. You see, go to the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter. Notice something the Bible says. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, don't ever forget this. Revelation, the 13th chapter. In Revelation, chapter 13, the Bible makes it very clear, a reality that you and I must embrace and must accept. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 13, and we're going to now look at Revelation 13, verse 14. In Revelation 13 and verse 14, the Bible says, And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So according to the Bible, the way that the image of the beast is going to be set up is not from top down, but from bottom up. Did you see that in the verse? It says, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. So the way the image of the beast is going to be set up, the power lies with the people. It's not going to be from the government just simply saying, we want what we want, so it is what it is. What the government is going to do is honor the vote of the people. So if the people say, we want it, then the governmental powers will say, we'll give it. But the people have to cooperate and want it first. Are you following that so far? Now watch this. We are told, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. That's all I want you to focus on in this quote. For time's sake, we're going to move forward. The final movements will be rapid ones. Now, we are told some of these things that are final movements, they're going to begin to take place, and it's going to affect the people of God in such a way that look what it says next. It says, the condition of things in the world shows that troublous times are right upon us. It says, the daily papers are full of indications of a terrible conflict in the near future. That's why you should pay attention to what's going on in the news. Because the daily papers are the ones that's making us aware this crisis is coming. Now, it says, bold robberies are of frequent occurrence. Strikes are common. Thefts and murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. Men have become infatuated with vice, and every species of evil prevails. Now, one of the things that took place in America, and I'm sure you have several calamities that have happened here in the Philippines as well, but one of the things that took place in America, there was a time there was something called the Columbine High School shootings. How many of you remember this? The Columbine High School shootings. You know, these boys, they came in, and they started to gun down students in the school and teachers. Of course, many people died. Here's where all the people who became casualties of that crisis. And this is outside of the two boys who eventually killed themselves. 
But then after the Columbine High School attack, then there was the Virginia Tech attack. How many of you remember Virginia Tech? Virginia Tech. Now, when Virginia Tech took place, that was done by a young man there, and that still is on record as the greatest massacre to ever take place in a school environment because it was not just 9 or 12 people that died, but it was 31. 31 people that were massacred. The young man just came in there, loaded with guns, and just started shooting people randomly. And here it is again. Now, think about that quote, men possessed with demons. We're going to go around, and then we're going to start killing people. And it says even little children. And the reason why I thought that's significant is because there were articles after articles from December 11th, 2012, September 27th, 2012, August 5th, 2012, July 20th, 2012, over and over and over again, gunmen killing people, killing people, random killing, just taking place all throughout. Now, these are things just happening in America, and you need to pay attention to this because America plays a very significant role in prophecy upon which the Philippines and every other country is going to follow suit. Now, here it is that all these things are taking place, one after the other, article after article, but then there was Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook hit the world by storm. This is the massacre that took place, I believe, December of last year, where young, a young man goes inside of a school, and he decides not only to create a massacre and killing people, but he specifically kills 20 children. It, of course, affected the president himself and many others because 20 children were killed and six adults as well. All of the children were six and seven years old. They were killed point-blank range by a gun. And this man did that. And in every single one of these cases, Columbine High School, the young men come in, kill the people, kill themselves. Virginia Tech, the young man comes in, kills the people, kills himself. Sandy Hook, the young man comes in, kills the little children, kills himself. Men possessed by demons. These individuals, brothers and sisters, are surrendering themselves to Satan. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from this world. People are making final decisions. God will not tolerate our rebellion much longer. Today, if you hear God's voice, you must harden not your heart. This world is wicked and it's getting worse. It's not getting any better. And God is trying to raise up a people that are going to say, who is going to stand on the Lord's side? This world needs the gospel like it never needed it before because I'm telling you the truth. Don't you get too mesmerized about what's just happening in the Philippines because what's, or in America because what's happening in America is being duplicated slowly but surely in every other country on the globe. And God is trying to wake up people up. And this is why we are to understand our work right now, our work right now is not a work just simply telling everybody that Jesus loves them. Our work is an uncomfortable work, brothers and sisters. How many of you know who this man is? Any of you know who that man is? He's a major figure in Christianity. He was alive during the days of Ellen White. His name is George Mueller. George Mueller did a wonderful work. How many of you ever heard of George Mueller? Is anybody, is anybody familiar with George Mueller? Okay. If you're familiar with George Mueller, do you, do you remember what George Mueller did? What was the work that George Mueller did? That's very good. George Mueller was responsible for creating an orphanage where he it created an environment for many children who had no parents, and he would go ahead and teach them and instruct them in the fear and admonition of the Lord and would help them. Seventh-day Adventists began to observe the work of George Mueller, and Seventh-day Adventists got so excited off of the work that George Mueller was doing that we began to imitate that work, and we wanted to go ahead and start up orphanages and all these other things as well. Well, when this started to happen, Sister White saw it necessary to write to God's people to redirect their thoughts. And I want you to notice what she said. She said, God does not now lay upon his people the same work which was laid upon Mueller. Mueller did a noble work, but God has given his people a work to do after a different plan. To them, he has given a message for the whole world. They are to enter territory after territory and make aggressive warfare against soul-destroying sins. Our work is to make aggressive warfare against soul-destroying sins. When you look at what's taking place all throughout our communities, 
When you look at what's taking place throughout the landscape of what's happening here in the Philippines and you see the various sinful activity taking place, we are called by God to make aggressive warfare against these soul-destroying sins. We are to point people to Christ in the sanctuary and show them that there's a way out of the sinful lifestyle. There's a way out of the bondage that sin can bring upon mankind. And people are looking for that. People are looking for a God who can give them victory. And you have the message, but you got to be faithful to your calling. And so God has given us a message that is designed to bring everything to a close. Now, the reason this needs to be done is because when God gave the message of the three angels to us, do you know the whole purpose of the three angels' messages? The great purpose of the three angels' messages, brothers and sisters, is found in this quotation right here. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. Since 1844, the investigative judgment has begun. God has given a message to his people that's designed to show them how to stand during this investigative judgment so that when the judgment closes and probation closes, mankind will be able to stand before God and stand faithful unto God even without a mediator. This is the great work that Jesus wants to accomplish right now. He wants you and I to become so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, that we cannot be moved. The reason God wants us to embrace this experience right now is because there is a plan of Rome. Rome has put together a plan to make sure you and I are unfit to stand true to God in the investigative judgment. Rome has put together the most diabolical plan to make sure, and the reason why you need to especially be concerned with this here in the Philippines is because you are predominantly Roman Catholic as a nation. So the influence of Rome is very strong. And God needs people like you to stand up and to lift up the banner of the three angels' messages before the masses of these people so that they may understand where we are in time so they can know what to do. We have been told, according to the Catholic rep record, September 1st, 1923, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Rome has made it clear that we are above the Bible. We don't do what the Bible says. We tell you what the Bible says. And Rome believes that they are so much above the Bible that they can try, try to change God's Sabbath. And therefore, they said, Sunday observance, that's the mark of our authority. Now, Rome is the first beast of Revelation 13. So the beast is identifying from their own mouths what their mark is. The mark of the beast is the enforcement of Sunday observance. Now, this is the great plan of Rome right now. And we're told here, the change of the Sabbath is the sign or mark of the authority of the Roman church. Those who understand the claims of the fourth commandment choose to observe the false Sabbath in the place of the true are thereby paying homage to that power by which alone it is commanded. The mark of the beast is the papal Sabbath, which has been accepted by the world in the place of the day of God's appointment. That is the mark of the beast. It is the papal Sabbath. Now watch this. Because of this fact, we're told... As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. So even though America leads out, how many countries? How many countries? Every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. It goes on to say foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. That's why I'm telling you, whatever's going to happen in America, eventually it's just going to come around and it's going to circle back where it's going to affect all of God's people all throughout the world. So we're all getting ready to face this. You understand that? Now, the Bible talks about the mark of the beast, but God talks about a seal. 
Now, remember, the mark of the beast can be received in the forehead or the hand. The seal, however, is forehead only. Now, when we look at this carefully, the question is, why did God use a seal? Why did he use that as an example? The reason why is found in Esther, the eighth chapter. Let's go to the book of Esther, chapter 8. Esther, chapter 8. And I want you to notice what the Bible says. We're talking about why did God choose to use a seal. Let's notice what the Bible says as we consider Esther, the eighth chapter. When you get there, please say amen. It's right before the book of Job. You have Psalms, you have Job, and then you have Esther. The Bible says in Esther, the eighth chapter and the eighth verse. If you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Esther chapter 8 and verse 8, it says, Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man what? Reverse. Why did God use a seal to represent what he wants to do with his people? Because once he seals his people, no man can reverse it. And as a result of that, when we think of the seal of the living God, remember we are told, what is the seal of God and can it be seen? No. It says it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. So God wants to seal you. He wants to seal me. But the only way we're going to be sealed is we must be settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. So therefore, this is what God wants to do in your heart and in my heart right now. He wants to settle us into the truth. This is why you should be studying the Bible like you've never studied it before. This is why you need to be studying the spirit of prophecy like you never studied it before because we are surrounded, brothers and sisters. The world is against God and his truth, and there are many in the Seventh-day Adventist church that are tares. And tares do one thing. They choke the living plants. There are people in the Seventh-day Adventist church that are not for God's message. And they are going to rise up against the message, and they will try to destroy the message from within. And this is why you cannot afford to listen to preachers. You cannot afford to trust ministers. You can respect ministers. You can respect leaders, but do not trust ministers. Do not put your trust in leaders. God never asked you to do that. You respect ministers. You respect leaders. But you don't put your trust in them. And it doesn't matter if they're self-supporting leaders or if they are conference-paid leaders. It does not matter, brothers and sisters. You don't go ahead and put your trust in any leader. I have had people come to me so many times and they'll say, Brother Lemon, I, you are a man of God. And I very seriously, I look them in the eye and I say, how in the world did you figure that? And I'm serious, brothers and sisters. You know why I say that? Because you know why most people think I'm a man of God? Because they heard me preach sermons. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Satan can preach a sermon. Satan can preach a good sermon. People are not men and women of God just because they could preach well. A man and a woman of God is somebody whose lives are surrendered to Jesus Christ. That's a Christian. The question is, who am I when I get off this pulpit? Who am I when I'm alone with my wife and nobody else is looking? Who am I when I'm by myself and nobody else is looking? Who am I when I'm talking to God's people and I'm not in a suit and I'm just in a pair of sweatpants and sneakers just like you? Am I the same man of God? Are you the same man of God? Are you the same woman of God? Christianity is not a job. Christianity is not something that you punch a clock on it and say, today I'm a Christian and tonight I'm not. Yes, the Sabbath may be over. Yes, the sun may have set. But brothers and sisters, the sun of righteousness should still be shining in your hearts. 
You never put Jesus out. You never turn Jesus off. He should always be alive and living in your life, manifesting himself through your life, whether it's a Saturday or a Wednesday. We are to be holy people every single day of the week. And it is when we understand this that we will begin getting settled into the truth. It is when we understand that I don't care if I'm in another country or I don't care if I'm in front of my own family, I must be the same man of God that my children see that you see on a pulpit. And that's the greatest concern of my life. Brothers and sisters, just May 25th, uh, last month, that marked 16 years that I've been privileged to be married to my bride. 16 years. And let me tell you something. My wife and I, we went on vacation and we went away and we, went, we found a nice quiet place where we could talk to each other. And I asked, I said, honey, I said, have I been the husband that God has called me to be to you over these past 16 years? Have I been that husband? Because I want to please my wife. Jesus wanted to please the church. And I want to please my wife. I want to be recognized as a man of God by my wife. When a wife can say, when I look at my husband, I see a man of God. Brothers and sisters, that's, a, that's, that's one of the most beautiful things that a human being can say about you. When a husband can look at his wife and he can say, when I think of my wife, I see a woman of God. Before he talks about how pretty she is, before he talks about how great she dresses, before he says how talented she is in her skill sets, a man should be able to look at his bride and be able to say, when I look at my wife, I see a woman of God. She reminds me of Jesus Christ. When a woman looks at her husband, she should say that. When children look at their parents, the children should be able to say, when I look at my mother and my father, I see a man of God. I see Jesus when I think of my daddy. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. It is my life work by the grace of God that my children will be able to say, when I look at Daddy, he reminds me of Jesus. I, it is my life work that when my wife looks at me, that she can say, when I look at my husband, Dwayne, off the pulpit when nobody else is looking or listening, he's still a man of God. Brothers and sisters, it's only when we are determined to follow Jesus in the church, out of the church, Sabbath, no Sabbath. It is when we are determined that it is Christ and Christ alone that must be lifted up in my life and in my character. This is how you start getting settled into the truth. Jesus becomes first, last, and best. Now, brothers and sisters, when the Sunday law test comes to God's people, according to Great Controversy, page 605, it is when we are going to receive either the mark of the beast or the seal of the living God. When that Sunday law test comes to us, it's going to reveal everything that's in us. I often refer to the Sunday law test as a squeeze. You all have sponges, don't you? You've used a sponge before. And when you squeeze a sponge, whatever's in the sponge comes out of the sponge. Is that right? When the Sunday law test comes here to the Philippines, you're all going to be squeezed by it. But the problem is, is that if there is any ray of self still alive in you, when that squeeze comes, if there's self still alive in you, self is going to come out of you. And this is why we are living in a time where we must receive Christ in us the hope of glory, so that if Jesus is in us fully, his character fully demonstrated in our lives, then when the Sunday law test comes and squeezes us, the only thing that could come out of us is what was in us. And if Christ is in us, then when it squeezes us, only Christ can come out of us. And we will respond to the crisis how Jesus responded to the crisis. And this is why today, if you hear God's voice, you cannot harden your heart, saints. You must follow the Lamb whithersoever he may lead. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And therefore we find, in Rome, they made it clear. When through the centuries she has made laws concerning Sunday rest, the church has had in mind, above all, the work of servants and workers. 
Certainly not because this work was any less worthy when compared to the spiritual requirements of Sunday observance, but rather because it needed greater regulation to lighten its burden and thus enable everyone to keep the Lord's Day holy. This is an article called Dies Domini. How many of you have this article, Dies Domini? How many of you are familiar with Dies Domini? Oh, my word. All right. Listen, in 1998, Pope John Paul II wrote a little article called Dies Domini. It was designed to, to, to encourage Christians to strive to get Sunday laws started. Notice what it says. Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. Dies Domini was an article put together to make sure that Christians will strive and go to government to try to get Sunday laws passed. Now, when he put this article together in 1998, by the way, you can Google this. Google D.S. Domini, D-I-E-S Domini, D-O-M-I-N-I, D.S. Domini. If you Google that, you'll get this whole article. This is public open information. Now, here it is that in this article, he said, he's showing us the secret of how Rome has passed Sunday laws. I told you Rome has a plan. Notice Rome's plan. When through the centuries she has made laws concerning Sunday rest, the church has had in mind above all the work of servants and workers. So according to that statement, how has Rome successfully established Sunday laws in the past centuries? By focusing on what? That's an open book test, saints. When through the centuries she has made laws concerning Sunday rest. She is the Roman Catholic Church. When through the centuries the Roman Catholic Church has made laws concerning Sunday rest, the church has had in mind above all the what? Work of servants and workers. So what was Rome's method of passing Sunday laws? What was the method? Focus on the people. Focus on the needs of the people. That was Rome's method. Now, understanding that, here we have articles now. The People. This is a magazine that's very popular in the States called Newsweek. How many of you are aware of Newsweek? You know about that magazine, Newsweek? Newsweek, very popular magazine. There was an article that came out that said, why isn't Sunday special anymore? And it was Americans talking about how they need to come back to Sunday observance, Sunday rest. Then Time Magazine. How many of you are familiar with Time Magazine? Time Magazine. And on the seventh day we rested, maybe those old blue laws weren't so crazy after all. So here it is that in Time Magazine, again, they were promoting Sunday observance. They were saying, we need to come back to Sunday observance. We need to come back to Sundays where people can get some time off. But all of these articles were talking about going to government. That's key. They kept saying, we need to go to government. We need to go to government. We need the government to mandate a day off, which of course was Sunday. Now this is exactly what Rome wants. And remember, how does this thing get set up? It gets started with the people. So watch this. Over and over again, never on Sundays, some retailers closing for religious reasons. Everybody starts saying, we need Sundays off. We need Sundays off. We need Sundays off. Big articles. We're told in volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 141, the substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. It's the final test. Now, looking at this right here, these people, they went to government and said, we demand that the government gives us Sundays off. Do you know who these people are? Do you know what country this is? Israel. Will Sunday become part of the Israeli weekend? Look at what it says. This is, this is April 4th, 2011. Vice Premier Shalom decides to launch a campaign on issue and says the move would cause a revolution as people will receive more leisure rest time. Notice what the focus is. They want a mandate from the government standpoint, a Sunday off, and the purpose is for the people to have more rest. Remember what was Rome's method of how to pass Sunday laws? Focus on the needs of the people. 
Now look at this. It says, a decade's worth of efforts to push the government to make Sunday a day off were renewed over the past two weeks after Vice Premier Sylvan Shalom decided to begin a campaign on the issue. This would cause a revolution in Israel, Shalom said in a statement released Thursday. This would make our country more normal? Ladies and gentlemen, when you think of Jewish people, you think about the Seventh-day Sabbath. You don't think about Sunday, do you? So how is it that a Jewish man is saying that if we have a Sunday law in Israel, it'll make our country more normal? That makes no sense. Are you following? So here it is that they're saying it'll give people more leisure and allow them to return to the work week on Monday a lot more rested. So notice that they're focusing on that. But it was not just Israel. It was also Singapore. Uh-oh, that's getting close to home now. What did they do in Singapore? They made a big issue. Look at what they said. The Singapore maids are to finally get a day off. So there was a lot of maids that were working, and they were overworking themselves, and therefore they wanted to get a day off. So notice that they went to government to establish it. It says, we need to treat our foreign labor force decently, Manpower Minister tells Parliament, May 6, 2012. The Singaporean government's recognition of a weekly rest day as a basic labor right will make the lives of migrant domestic workers better, said Nisha Varia, senior woman's uh, right researcher at U.S.-based Human Rights Watch. But this important reform should go into effect this year and apply to all domestic workers and their current contracts. So notice that, again, they went to government. They said, we want the government to mandate Sundays off so that the maids can have some more rest time with their families. Now, brothers and sisters, this gets very interesting because over and over and over again, it's the government getting involved to establish Sundays as a means of telling people that they need to take time off. Over and over and over again, we see it being agitated. It's happening all over the world. It's happening also in Greece. Eurozone demands that Greece mandates a six-day work week in exchange for second bailout. This is in the New York Daily News, September 5th, 2012. Recent articles, less than a year old. Greece is in so much financial trouble that they needed a second bailout. And as a result of that, to, in order to accommodate it, they have to mandate a six-day work week. Now, here's what's interesting. Six-day work week, that means that there's only one day that's going to be a day of rest. So the question is, what day is it that they're going to mandate people to work on in the weekend? Is it Saturday or is it Sunday? Well, let's notice. But never on Sunday, says Greek Prime Minister Antonis Samaras. So in other words, they're going to allow Sunday to be the only rest day, and they're going to begin to mandate that the people work on Saturdays. You know what that smells like? Persecution. Brothers and sisters, this thing is being agitated all over our world. And do you know what's really sad? The majority of Seventh-day Adventists are asleep. They don't even realize what's going on. They don't understand what's taking place, and they don't know what they should be doing right now. And this is a problem, brothers and sisters. These truths should not be when some American has to come down here and to tell you these things. You should be hearing this on a regular basis from your own ministers. It's a tragedy, brothers and sisters, when the only way that God's people can consistently receive these alarms is when thousands of dollars have to be spent on plane tickets and stay and food and all these things so that some foreigner can come and tell you these truths that the ministers right here locally are supposed to be teaching you on a regular basis. Something has to change, brothers and sisters, because you can't wait for another guest to come to tell you these things. You must study this for yourself. You have to start holding your leaders more accountable, and you have to go to them and say, listen, why aren't you teaching us these things? We need to hear more of this. We need to understand this. This is the message of the hour. Because, brothers and sisters, I'm about to show you something that's going to present the realities of where we are in time and what's getting ready, not just in the world, what's getting ready to happen to Seventh-day Adventists. 
I'm going to show you. You got to take this thing serious, brothers and sisters. It is so easy. Let me tell you something, saints. I don't understand. You have had speaker after speaker come here. My dear friend, my friend, Andre Waller, he came here and he poured his heart out to God's people to say, get ready, get ready, get ready. Randy Skeet, he comes here and he pours his heart out to God's people to say, get ready, get ready, get ready. Several of God's ministers and God's workers, we're all coming here, and there's no new message to give you. It's the same message. Get ready, get ready, get ready. What more do you need to hear before you take it seriously? What is it that we're waiting for? What's going to come inside of your heart and motivate you that when you go, do you know when I was going down these streets and when I watched those people laying on the side of the road, I almost wanted to bust out of the car and go help those people. Is Jesus in your heart enough that when you see people suffering, your heart longs to help them? When you look at the sleeping saints in the Seventh-day Adventist church and you see that we are not doing what God has called us to do, does it do anything to your heart? Does it even move you, or have we become so spiritually numb that no matter how much messages, no matter how much Bible, no matter how much spirit of prophecy, we are just not moved? What do you need to hear? God wants us to understand time is almost finished. Brothers and sisters, this thing is about to wrap up. You are surrounded You have no idea what's getting ready to unfold. Truly do we understand what's getting ready to take place in this world. Oh, Jesus wants to save us. And then after saving us, he wants us to be instruments of salvation. We have to set aside our personal ambitions. We have to set aside all of our own selfish goals. We must get to a point to surrender our lives to Jesus and work for the master while it is day. For the night is coming where no man can work. June 6, 2012, Pope Benedict said, the demands of work can't bully people out of needed time off. Pope Benedict XVI said, Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone so people can be free to be with their families and with God, the Pope said. By defending Sunday, one defends human freedom. This is his words. These are the thoughts of Rome, that when you defend Sunday, you're defending human freedom. How many of you believe in human freedom? Well, Rome says, the way that you have it is defend Sunday. And you think all these majority of Catholics all throughout this country here, you don't think they're going to pay attention to those words? They are going to push for this government. And right now, Rome has made... I I wonder if you're reading your own articles. I'm reading your articles. I'm looking at this issue. I'm looking at how the government, and I'm looking at the Church of Rome, and I'm looking at what the leaders in your country are saying on the issue of gay marriage, and they are making some very interesting statements. They are taking some strong stands. They're making decisions, brothers and sisters, and you and I are to be aware of these things. We're to understand these things. Now, look at this. He makes it clear, oh, you're defending human freedom when you defend Sunday. And it's very interesting because I'm going to go past this. Uh Uh-uh, I can't even touch this. There's no time. No time. No time. All right. Going past this. Going to go past this. Obviously, something very significant took place this year. This year, 
perhaps for the first time ever, or at least in centuries, a current pope decided to step down from his position and a new pope has been voted in. When Pope Francis took his position, one of the things that from the beginning was very interesting is that he was a Jesuit. Now, I don't even know if any of you have studied what a Jesuit is and what Jesuits do, but you should know, you should understand, there's deep implications. But it's not enough that he was simply a Jesuit priest. But it was what he did very shortly after he entered into office. The first thing that he did was he was offered to ride around in the Pope Mobile. But when he was riding around in the Pope, when, when he was offered to ride around in the Pope Mobile, you remember, he said, no, he says, I want to ride with the people. And he started taking the bus with the people. Now, the world looked at that, and the world said, how could this man do that? Doesn't he understand that's dangerous? Doesn't he understand that's crazy? People could want to kill him. And he didn't care about any of that. He said, I want to be close to the people. I want to minister to the people. So he decided to go ahead and take the bus, which was a tremendous statement of humility. Then after that, he was offered the regular room that the popes can stay in. He decided not to take it and he said, I'll just take one of the more simple apartments inside of the Vatican. I, won't take, I will not take the normal room that's designated for the Pope, the really nice room. He says, just give me one of the apartments inside of the building and I'll be fine. Here it is, the world began to wonder after this man because the world was thinking to themselves, how is it that this man is a Pope, but here it is, He's taking the bus instead of riding the Pope Mobile. He's staying in an apartment rather than the plush, luxurious, beautiful room that normally is set aside for the Pope. And then of all things, they find him one day in the prison meeting a bunch of juvenile youth who have committed crimes. And what is he doing with those youth? He's washing their feet. And he's doing communion. After he washes their feet, he then takes their feet and kisses it. Now, brothers and sisters, in Rome, people kiss the Pope's hand and feet. But here goes a Pope who says, I'm going to wash the people's feet and I will kiss their feet. The statement of humility that the current pope is making has caught the world by storm. The world literally loves this man because they're saying we have not seen such humility, such Christian character demonstrated in a pope in a long time. He visits prisons and ministers to the people and washes their feet. So people were watching this pope, and they were amazed. And one day I'm on the airplane, and as I was on the airplane coming from a meeting, and I remember flying there, and I was trying to do some research, and I said, Lord, what is it about this man? I said, help me understand more about him because I believe his role is significant, but I don't want to make up stuff. I want you to show me from inspiration. And you know what God did? God said, son, go to Great Controversy, page 234. And I did it. And I'm going to show you right now what Great Controversy 234 says, and you tell me if you see some wondrous things out of the words of God. It says, throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. Now look at this. <clears throat> the first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. I want you to capture what inspiration is showing us. 
When the Reformation was having success, Rome wanted to crush out the Reformation. The means that Rome used to crush them out was to create the Jesuit order. The purpose of the Jesuit order was to crush out any effect of true Protestantism and to exalt popery back to its original position. That is the purpose of the Jesuit order. She says that they were cruel. She says that they were unscrupulous. But she also says there was no crime too great for them to commit. No deception too base for them to practice. No disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vow to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. This was their mission. They said, we will take on any disguise necessary. We will put on the greatest act necessary so that we can deceive the people and crush Protestantism and restore popery. Now I thought, now brothers and sisters, when I read this, I, I was like, Lord, you're opening my eyes. You're helping me understand what's going on. And then God said, son, keep reading. Next thing I read, it says, when appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity visiting prisons. Did you catch that? Visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. Now I understand why he said, let me take the bus with the people. Now I understand why he said, no, don't give me the best room. Just give me the apartment. Now I understand he, why he visited the prisons and would wash the people's feet. You know why? Because he's doing what Jesuits do. He's doing what Jesuits do. He's putting on whatever disguise is necessary so that the people may be deceived so that ultimately he can crush out Protestantism and revive popery. Under various disguises, the Jesuits work their way into offices of state. Brothers and sisters, he wasn't just a Jesuit, but now he's a Jesuit pope. You understand that? He's in a high office now. It says, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. Can a pope do that? Can a pope counsel kings? Oh, yes, you better believe it. Can a pope shape policies of the nations? This is why, brothers and sisters, everything prophetically is showing us that it was very significant that we now have a Jesuit pope. A Jesuit pope. It goes on to say, the Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. Now, brothers and sisters, when I read this, I'll tell you the truth, my hands began to tremble as I was in that airplane, because it was as if for the first time I said, Lord, I see what's happening. Now I understood it clearly. Some people just, see, some people just, oh, he, he, it's a Jesuit pope. Oh, it's a Jesuit pope. And they were just simply saying that. But brothers and sisters, when you carefully study the methodical, the, the methodical manner of how Jesuits would go ahead and revive popery, I saw the plan of Rome. 
and we are here right now. And the world is so caught up in this man. Look at what it says. <clears throat> Emerson, May 24th, 2013. It says he behaves like one of us. This is, what, this is literally what the people are saying right now. People are saying he behaves just like one of us. It says he said he is infinitely small, just like St. Francis called himself. It's a nice break for the Catholic Church, which in recent years rose above the people. He is a man of the people. He doesn't sit on a pedestal. This is what the people are saying about him. They love him. They love him. And it's interesting because the Bible says all the world will do what? Wonder after the beast. People are wondering after this man right now. They are wondering after him. But well, watch this. Now, this is where it gets interesting. New York Times, April 26, 2013. Here it is. The Pope has made his statement. He says, I'll take the bus. He says, I'll stay in an apartment. He says, I'll visit the prisons and minister to all these poor people and kiss their feet and wash their feet and do everything else. He has demonstrated these things. He's won the confidence of the people. Now watch and notice what now he says. He states, responding to the question, do we need to rediscover the meaning of leisure? Pope Francis replies, Together with a culture of work, there must be a culture of leisure as gratification. To put it another way, people who work must take the time to relax, to be with their families, to enjoy themselves, read, listen to music, play a sport. But this is being destroyed in large part by the elimination of the Sabbath rest day. Hmm. Now he makes his statement on the Sabbath. You see, he couldn't just jump out and just start talking about the Sabbath. He had to win the confidence of the people first. So he comes out, he wins the confidence of the people, and now he's in a position where he makes his claim. And he says, you know, we need to come back to the Sabbath. Now he makes his claim. We need to come back to the Sabbath. And look at what it says next. It says, <clears throat> more and more people work on Sundays as a consequence of the competitiveness imposed by a consumer society. In such cases, he concludes, work ends up dehumanizing people. Last October, about 250 bishops met in Rome for a conference on the movement called the New Evangelization, which focuses on reawakening faith in those already baptized. One of their conclusions was, even though there is a tension between the Christian Sunday and the secular Sunday, Sunday needs to be recovered. In keeping, they wrote with John Paul's D.S. Domini. What did we learn about in Dies Domini? Christians will naturally strive to go to civil legislation to establish Sunday laws. Pope Francis says we need to go back to Dies Domini. Brothers and sisters, this thing is right around the corner. Everything that's happening around us. You know, I believe that the world is ready for a Sunday law. I believe God's people are not. And the reason it has not passed yet in America and in these other countries yet is because God is trying again to wake his people up. God is trying again to say, how many of my people are going to take my message seriously? And brothers and sisters, you need to do it quickly. You know why? We have a problem. What's our problem? Matthew chapter 7. We're getting ready to close. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Let me show you the problem. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, <clears throat> let me show you the problem. In Matthew, chapter 7, and verse 21, the Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Jesus makes it clear it is going to be church people that he's going to have to say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. They worked, but they were not Christians. This is why it's not enough to work for the Lord. It's not enough to just simply do good deeds because these people did good deeds. They cast out demons. That's a good deed. They did many wonderful works. That's a good deed. They prophesied. They preached the word of God in God's name. They did many wonderful works. But brothers and sisters, Jesus says, I don't know you. 
it's possible that we can work for the master and not know the master. And that's why Jesus says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Now watch this. Is this a majority or a minority of people in the church that Christ is saying this to? Is it a majority or minority? It's a majority. You want to know why? Go to verse 13 and 14. Same book, same chapter, verses 13 and 14. What does it say? The Bible says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and how many? It says, Many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and how many? Few there be that find it. Anytime you compare many with few, many is the majority. And the majority are going to go on the path of destruction. God wants us to understand that the majority of his people will not take heed to his warnings. They will not take heed to his messages. And this is why Ellen White says, when the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the what? Majority forsake us to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. The nation will be on the side of the great rebel leader. Brothers and sisters, we are told through inspiration that the majority are going to forsake us. Another term that is used for majority in Great Controversy 608, as the storm approaches. A large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but who were not, have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition, and they become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. Large class. Majority. Do you know there's over 17 million Seventh-day Adventists worldwide, the majority are going to turn their backs on Jesus when the Sunday law test comes to them. The majority, the majority, 17 million worldwide, the majority lost. That's a sad statement, brothers and sisters. Sad statement. How many Seventh-day Adventists are there in the Philippines? How many? Go ahead and shout it out to me. I don't know. How many? Somebody was telling me that you, your, 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 your numbers are fairly large. How, how many? 100,000? 500,000? A million? One million? Two million? How many? About two million. I want you to think about that. You have about two million Seventh-day Adventists in the Philippines. The majority of them are going to be lost. Why? 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 They didn't have to be. It's not that God didn't make enough effort. Why? You know why, you know why they're lost, right? Do You know why? Brothers and sisters, it's an open book test. Look at the quote. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but here's the problem. What was the problem? But what? Have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth. That's why they were not sanctified through obedience. Brothers and sisters, go to the book of Ezekiel 33. Look at this with me. Look at this. This is where we are in Adventism right now. Ezekiel 33. Watch this. It's exactly where we are right now. Ezekiel 33. I want you to look at this. We're going to look at Ezekiel 33 right there in verse 30. This is exactly where we are in our Adventist experience right now. Notice what the Bible says. When you get there, say amen. The Bible says in Ezekiel 33 verse 30, it says, Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, listen to what they're saying. Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh, from, cometh forth from the Lord. 
So notice what the people are doing. They're saying, oh, come, come, come hear the word. Now watch this. It goes on, verse 31. And they come unto thee, and they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words. Well, what's the problem? But they will not do them. It says, going on now, for with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. It says, and lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. That's exactly where the great majority of Seventh-day Adventists are right now. They say, oh, Andre Waller's coming in town. And everybody flocks to where Waller is. Oh, Randy Ski's coming to town. Everybody flocks to Randy Ski. Oh, Brother Lemon's coming to town. Everybody flocks to Brother Lemon. And they flock, flock, flock. And they're flocking around. They want to hear everything. And they love to hear it. But when the meeting is over, and when it's time to go back to day-to-day -day life, they hear your words as a lovely song, but they will not do it. What is the point of talking about health reform if you're going to eat the eggs and eat the milk and eat the chicken and eat the fish and eat the beef anyhow? What's the point of talking about it? We make these weak excuses and talk about verses in Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy and try to make it seem as if God thinks it's okay and we know it's not okay. What's the point of learning about dress? What's the point of learning about the, 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 the importance of morning and evening worship every day? What's the point about gathering our family and ministering unto our children and preparing them for the soon coming of Jesus Christ? Some of us are more concerned about our children becoming doctors and nurses before we are concerned that they are children of the Most High God. Brothers and sisters, how long? How long? You're going to wait till next week when Brother Skeet shows up? You're going to wait till next year and when the next great evangelist comes through? Is that what you want to wait for? And then you're going to hear the words as a lovely song again. Is that what you're waiting for? When are you going to do what God says? When are you going to finally say, you know what? I will lose everything. But I'm going to do what Jesus says. Brothers and sisters, time is almost finished. You know, one of the saddest things I read in the book Great Controversy is sad. She says that when Jesus comes after the millennium and the wicked dead who finally rise in the second resurrection, she says that God in panoramic view, in other words, like a movie screen, is going to go before the wicked. And if there's even one wicked person that would say, why am I going into the lake of fire? I don't deserve that. God is actually going to rewind the story of life. And do you know what's going to hurt a lot? The majority of those lost Seventh-day Adventists, God is going to play back, I sent this missionary to your church. And then you, you ignored them. Oh, you like to hear their sermons, but you ignored them. You didn't do what they were teaching. So I sent another missionary. And God is literally going to, he's going to show you where you sat. He's actually going to show people where they were sitting in the congregation. He said, there you are, right there. See that? Look at you. God's going to say, look at your face. Look, look at the way you were responding to the message right there. 
God is literally going to let them see themselves. And when they see themselves, do you know what they're going to say? They're going to look God in the eyes and they're going to say, you know what? You see that lake of fire right there? They're going to say, I deserve it. The saddest statement to come from the mouth of human beings. They're going to look at that lake of fire and they're going to say, you know what? You are righteous. You are just. You are holy. And I am not. I deserve that. And I remember reading that, brothers and sisters, and I just broke down in tears. I said, Lord, have mercy. And the first thing I did is I pleaded for myself. I said, Father, let nothing in this life keep me so close to it that it would cause me to lose out on being with you forever. I know there's strongholds in this world, brothers and sisters, but I pray that there's nothing that is so strong that is worth losing out on your salvation. The problem of why so many Seventh-day Adventists are going to be lost is because they love to hear, but they will not do. And I'm telling you something right now. It does not benefit you at all when you know that God has a dress standard and you choose to say whatever. It does not help you when you know God has principles on diet and you say whatever. It does not help you when you know that God has a standard on music and entertainment and recreation and we say, I know, but I'm just going to do what I want. Right now, we are living in the midst of very knowledgeable Seventh-day Adventists. I am not impressed with how much a man knows. I am impressed on how much a man lives. It's not that hard to memorize scripture. It's not that hard to memorize spirit of prophecy quotes. It's not that hard, brothers and sisters, to know how to take all these things and compile them and put them together. What's hard is to find somebody that actually loves Jesus enough to do what he said without question. And the world is dying to meet such Christians. And so I close by simply making this point. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Brothers and sisters, when that Sunday law test comes, it's going to come to seven-day Adventists first. It's going to come to us first because we know. But there's a whole number of people out there in the world that don't know the truths we know. God's going to give them another opportunity where for us the door will be closed because we had a chance. But like those foolish virgins, we kept procrastinating and putting off tomorrow what God has called us to do today. Don't fall into that trap, brothers and sisters. You don't have to. God is pleading with our hearts. We're told... Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. What we need is an experience of righteousness by faith. We need to realize, God, I can't go through this. Lord, I'm not prepared for this. Lord, there's nothing in me that can be prepared for this crisis that is soon to come. The majority of your people are going to be lost. The majority of the world is going to turn their back on you. The majority is going to say, we don't want Jesus. Give us Barabbas. But Lord, I want to be faithful. I want to trust you. You know, one time I looked at a baby. And I remember that there was a baby that even whenever I would look at the baby, the baby would just go ahead and hide their face in their mother's arms. One day that mother put that baby down. And the baby was just kind of standing and looking. And then when that mother walked away, just a couple of steps, that baby was just standing and looking. And then the baby looked at me. And immediately the baby looked at the mother. And the baby immediately started wobbling over trying to grab their mother. And I looked at that child and I said, you know, that is so cute. Because that baby is demonstrating that they feel insecure away from their parent. Once that child is next to their mother, that child could look at me, and that child could look at me and look at me because as far as the child's concerned, I'm with my security. 
You can't do anything to me because I'm with my security. Babies feel invincible as long as they're with their security. You know, brothers and sisters, God is your security. Through this crisis that's getting ready to come, Jesus, he's your security. He says, I have already overcome the world. And therefore, he says, I'm inviting you to let me into your heart. I want you to accept my righteousness. I want you to not accept my righteousness just as something that happened in the past. Jesus says, I want you to accept my righteousness as something that I can do now in you and through you in the present. False Christianity focuses on what Christ did for us only. True Christianity focuses on what Christ did for us and what he does in us and through us right now. That's the true picture of righteousness by faith. It is not simply what Jesus did for me, but it's what Jesus does in me and through me right now. These are the words of Paul in Galatians 2.20, where he makes it clear, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, Lord, do you love Jesus enough that you'll let him live out his life within you? That's what he wants to do, saints. You don't have to be lost. You don't have to be swept away in this storm. But you're going to have to not just know what God requires. You must do what God says. Blessed are the doers of the word. My hope and my prayer is that each and every one of you as my brothers and my sisters will learn what it is to walk by faith and not by sight. To realize that God can do anything in you and through you for his glory. I remember the Lord made it clear to me. I remember I used to curse and swear like a stale. I love to tell the story because it's powerful. Because I used to curse, brothers and sisters. I used to use foul language all the time. And it was one of those vices in my life that I just felt I cannot get victory over this thing. I mean, I don't care how much I tried. I just could not overcome. Couldn't overcome. And then one day, I remember, and I'm a Christian. I gave my heart to the Lord. I joined a Seventh-day Adventist church. Knew a lot about Bible prophecy. Knew a lot about the quotations from Ellen White. Studied all sorts of things. Committed things to memory. But at the end of the day, I just went from being an ignorant sinner to an intelligent sinner. I just knew more. But at the end of the day, Satan could still use me whenever he wanted. And one day, I went before God and I said, Father... I know that cursing and swearing is a sin. You see, when you read Matthew 26, it talks about the story of Peter. And it talks about how Peter, uh, uh, you know, the people came to him and said, hey, weren't you one of the followers of Christ? And Peter said, nope, not me. Came to Peter again. Hey, wait a minute. I think you were one of those followers of Christ. Peter said, nope, not me. Second time. The third time they came to him, they said, no, I know you're one of the followers of Jesus. And you know why they said that? They said, because you talk like a Christian. You sound like a follower of Christ. Peter wanted to prove he was not a follower of Jesus Christ. And you know what Peter did? The Bible says he began to curse and to swear. In other words, cursing and swearing is not just bad. Cursing and swearing is an audible example of a man making an effort to make it known, I don't know Jesus. When a person uses foul language, they are making it known, I don't know Jesus. That's what Peter was trying to do when he cursed. He wanted to say, watch me. Listen to my words. You think I'm a Christian? Let me show you I'm not a Christian. Because what I'm about to do, Christians don't do. And he began to curse and to swear. I said, Lord... I need to overcome this thing. I need your grace. I need your power. 
And you know what God did? I said, Lord, if you don't take this thing away from me, this is my exact words. I said, if you don't take this thing away from me, I'm going to keep cursing because I can't stop on my own. Do you know, brothers and sisters, the following day came by and I went to the barbershop and spent some time with my friends. And as I was there with my friends, we began to talk. And the people kept talking to me and talking to me and talking to me. And it got to a point that in there talking to me, that at one point, one brother said, wait a minute, what's going on? And, and, and we were wondering, what, 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 what's happening? And he said, what's going on? They said, Dwayne has not cursed, not once, since we've been talking. My friends noticed that I wasn't cursing. But you know what gets even sweeter? I didn't notice it. Did you just catch what I just said? My friends noticed that I wasn't cursing. I didn't notice it. In other words, God literally answered my prayer. My prayer was, Lord, I can't stop. I need you to take this thing away and take it out of my heart. Take the taste of it out of my mouth. And God did it, brothers and sisters. This is the heart reform. This is the heart surgery that Jesus and Jesus alone can do. He can take a wicked heart, a stony heart, and he can make it a heart of flesh as long as we're willing to come to him and let him have his way. And you see this point right here? She says the third angel's message is justification by faith in verity. And you know what I, I asked myself one day? I said, what is justification by faith anyhow? You know what justification by faith really is, saints? There's a woman who realizes her wretchedness, her sinfulness. And this woman realizes that she is not worthy to be in the presence of Jesus. But yet she comes to him. And as she comes to Jesus, she takes her hair. You know, a woman's hair in the Bible is referred to as her glory. She takes her hair, and then she takes some oil, pours the oil on the feet of Jesus, and she begins to use her hair and wipe Jesus' feet with it. You know, Jesus' feet had dust in it. She laid her hair, which is her glory, in the dust. And as I think about this woman going before the master, anointing his feet with oil with her own hair, and I think about the question, what is justification by faith? Inspiration says, what is justification by faith? It says, it is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. The essence of the third angel's message is to help us realize and recognize that there's something coming that no natural man can be prepared for it and go through it without God. And when you go to Jesus, you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Give me your grace. Give me your power. Show me how to enter into this experience that I can be prepared for this final crisis. And by your grace, be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And God will do the impossible in your life. Is there a sin right now in your life that you think God, it's impossible for God to give you victory over it? That's the very sin that God wants you to let him take it. If there's something in your life, something about your character, something about your way and your personality and your mentality that makes you say, I can't get victory over this. I will never change. Oh, that's Satan's lie, brothers and sisters. Don't believe Satan's lie. You can have victory through Jesus Christ right now, tonight. God says, I can give it to you. I can help you overcome whatever it may be, but you got to trust in me. You're going to have to learn how to live the life of faith and everything that God tells us to do. We can do it but we have to trust him to be our power source to make it real, and he will make it real. Faith is ours to exercise, but joyful feeling and the blessing is God's to give to us.
And so it is tonight. If you realize, brothers and sisters, that I'm not ready for this crisis, there's no way I ever can be in and of myself, but I need Jesus. I need him in a very real way, and I want him to transform my heart. I want to make sure that I will not be counted amongst that large class. I want to make sure that I will be counted amongst those who will be recognized as the faithful few. If it's your desire to say, Lord, I'm not ready for this. I am not ready for this, but I know you can make me ready. And I avail myself to you, and I choose to live a life where it is not my will, but thy will that shall be done. And if you're really willing to make that declaration, and really willing to say, Lord, my life is no longer mine. Whatever you say, I will do. Then I want you to stand to your feet with me. Whatever you say, I will do. There's many things Jesus has said people won't do. Many things Jesus said that people won't do. Today you tell people, well, the spirit of prophecy tells us we should do this and we should do that. And people say, oh, don't tell me that. Tell me what the Bible says. You, you're showing that you don't believe. You, then you're not doing what Jesus said. If you reject Ellen White's statements, understand that you're not rejecting her. You're rejecting the testimony of Jesus. If you accept Ellen White's statements, you're not accepting her. You're accepting the testimony of Jesus. You and I must understand that God has given us a, pro a prophetic lens to recognize where we are in time. Nothing that Ellen White says cannot be substantiated from the Bible. So therefore, we must be willing to accept the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and do what God has called us to do so that we can be a people prepared to meet our God. And brothers and sisters, don't wait for the next speaker to come. Don't let that be your fuel. You get your communion with God every day. If your ministers won't give it to you, then while you try to encourage them to do what's right, you make sure you do what's right. You spend your time with God. You spend your time in communion and studying with Jesus Christ, and he'll teach you. He'll teach you everything that the minister should have taught you, and he'll teach it to you right, and he will empower you to live what you've learned. But brothers and sisters, you've got to get to a point that you stop relying on man to give you what you need to know how to walk with the Lord. You've got to learn how to walk with him on your own, one-on-one, -on -one, and God will do it. Amen? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we close. Our loving Father, we are grateful. For the time that we have spent here, we thank you for another Sabbath day that has gone into eternity. We thank you, dear God, for your watch, care, and your mercy that has kept us throughout this day. And Lord, we accept the counsel that you have given to the church, Laodicea. You have helped us to see our wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked position. But we praise you and thank you that you have a better way. You have eyes solved. You have gold that's tried in the fire. You have white raiment that you offer us even now. And Lord, I pray that you will show us how to live that life of Jesus and how to walk in his footsteps. I ask, dear God, that you will please help us to see our need for you and that we will recognize that without you we can do nothing, but with Jesus we can do all things because he'll be our source of strength. And as he was able to endure the cross, despising the shame, we can endure the crisis knowing that it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Fulfill your promise within us, May Christ in us, the hope of glory, be our source of strength and hope and comfort as we go through the final scenes of earth's history. Bless my brothers and my sisters, and may they be found faithful even unto death. For it is then and only then that they shall receive their crowns of life. We thank you for hearing this prayer, and we thank you for answering it. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.